According to these new readings, I think we have an excellent chance of actually catching a ghost and holding it indefinitely. Hey, ghost heads. It's Heidi from Channeling Spirits. We are on part two of our series exploring the history and physics behind the Ghostbusters equipment. If you haven't seen our video on the Proton Pack, be sure to check it out because we will be adding on to the concepts we've already explored. Since we've talked about how the boys in gray wrangle ghosts, how exactly do they capture them? With the ghost or muon trap, of course. It's a trap! In the autumn of 1981, Dan Aykroyd was struck with the idea of freezing, at least momentarily, the image of an apparition. This became the genesis of a script titled <laughs> Ghost Smashers. Dan intended it to be another comedy vehicle for himself and John Belushi. Sadly, John passed away while Dan was in the middle of writing the first treatment. Though drastically different than the final film, Ghost Smashers did have several elements, including the equipment and Slimer, who at the time was a gluttonous yellow mist of grotesquely altered human form. However, the entrapment occurs in a basement at the Greenville Guest House, where the boys encircle it with neutrona beams and maneuver it into a small, collapsible trap. That is the earliest surviving definition of the ghost trap, and leaves quite a bit to the imagination. In fact, every draft of the script from then on refers to it only as the trap, which is true in Ghostbusters 2. The final films only call them traps. The trap, 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 it's a trap. When Harold Ramis was brought in to ground Dan's fantastic first draft, the duo wrote a sequence which would be largely unchanged even in the final shooting script. In the August 5th, 1983 draft, it describes the capture of Slimer. Bankman jerks his leg up, triggering a release on his equipment belt. A cord and foot pedal fall to the floor. At the end of the cord, there is a long, flat black metal box two feet long, four inches wide, and two inches high. The exact measurements of the trap are likely from Dan Aykroyd, considering he has always been particularly detailed regarding the equipment. Those are muon scrubbers up there. Ah. The script even details when the pedal is stomped. The trap sprays up a fixed, multi-dimensional inverted pyramid of bright, beaded white light, which is seen in the final film. By the September 30th, 1983 draft, the only change is that Egon deploys the trap, and in the final film, it's Ray. Tom Enrique's early storyboard of the capture of Slimer shows what may have been the first depiction of the trap. He illustrates the leg jerk and trap release, as well as a design not too dissimilar from the final one in the film. But who was the one who imagined the prop we would finally see? Stephen Dane, of course. The man who also originated the look of the proton pack and so much more. Dane's early concept designs had a narrow vacuum slot and described the handle similar to one found on a curling stone. Perhaps inspired by Tom's storyboard, the end result would have the familiar hinged doors. It was like an upside down set of Bombay doors, except instead of the bombs coming out, something gets sucked in. Dane purchased the materials for the ghost trap, likely using some of the aircraft junk he acquired when scavenging the Tuscan plane wrecking area while working on Blade Runner. As Dane described, it's all hardware that I've seen somewhere, but never in this combination. Just like the proton packs, the design was turned over to Chuck Gaspar to actually be fabricated. Several versions of the ghost trap would be created. There are the hero traps, which had rolling wheels, working electronics, lights, and a releasable canister. The stunt traps, which were lighter and worn by the actors during action shots. And the smoking traps, which contained fabric strips soaked in smoke-generating liquid to produce the effect. The sequel would feature largely the same design and a slight decrease in size since some actors complained about the weight of the equipment. I always hated this part of the business. 
when the real Ghostbusters aired, it added a tremendous amount to the mythology, including the equipment. It was the first time the name of the trap was expanded upon. Back through our Ecto Trap. But it still had a design similar to the movie. It also introduced the concept of the trap being able to release ghosts, presumably by reversing the polarity of the electromagnets inside, but we'll get to that. The original films never showed a limitation to the storage of individual ghost traps and showed two class four entities being captured in one trap. Two in the box, ready to go. We be fast and they be slow. Wow. But the real Ghostbusters understandably showed that there is a limit to the psychokinetic energy each personal unit could hold. There's too many ghosts in the trap. It wasn't made to hold that many. It could overload at any second. Which could be why Ray leaves his trap when facing a class seven like Gozer. However, the show introduced the idea that multiple traps could be holding the PKE of one entity. In Ghostbusters the video game, there is no limit to the number of entities contained in a single trap. This is also where the name Muon Trap is introduced. Ray, prepare the Muon Trap. Switching on the Muon Trap. Oh yeah, my favorite song, Switched On Muon. It also expands on the physics of how exactly they work. Upgrades allow for faster trapping and slam dunk trapping. In addition, the Ecto-1B is outfitted with the Super Slammer. The Super Slammer? Sounds untested. Tacky and exciting. I'm in. Designed to potentially capture a significantly weakened Babylonian god. Sumerian, not Babylonian. Yeah, big difference. Extreme Ghostbusters redesigned the trap in response to the increased level of psychokinetic energy. And then, of course, the ghost trap would have to be modified in order to correlate with the augmented proton charge. But before getting too far, we have to talk about how exactly the ghost traps are powered. In the September 30th draft, Ray shows Winston the storage facility, depositing a canister before tossing the trap tray into a bin marked for recharge. It is quite possible that before descending into the sewers in Ghostbusters 2, they recharged their traps, which is how they were able to use them after potentially five years of inactivity. Given the space constraints, the rechargeable battery pack would have to be located in the back of the trap here. This is also where the activation switch and lights are. But how exactly does it trap ghosts? Well, we have to go back to the term muon trap and our model of negatively charged ions with PKE bonds. As we talked about, the proton streams can weaken those bonds by stripping valence electrons. The accelerated protons can also crash into the atomic nuclei. The collision produces several particles, one of them being a pion. Pions quickly decay into muons, a negatively charged particle with a mass 206 times greater than an electron. Muons can knock the electrons out of their orbit, creating a muonic hydrogen. Being more massive, they literally begin to weigh the ectoplasmic entity down. While some lower classes of entities can be caught without proton streams, the cable and pedal allow the trap to be deployed with less danger to the operator. Thanks for shorting your stream, I don't want my face burned off. Once activated, the trap engages a powerful positive electromagnet, which pulls the manifestation inside. One unanswered enigma is what happens when you look into the trap while it's open. I looked at the trap, Ray. Some have hypothesized that one soul could get sucked inside, but the truth is more practical. The containment cone can simply be blinding, which is why even Vankman, a skeptic, closes his eyes. Pressing the pedal again closes the canister doors and seals the entity inside. To contain it, the ghost trap works as a variation of the penning trap. A homogeneous axial magnetic field confines the manifestation radially, while a quadruple electric field contains it axially. Ray, 
for a moment, pretend that I don't know anything about metallurgy, engineering, or physics, and just tell me what the hell is going on. When a significant amount of ions are detected, the valence indicator lights up. This was actually mentioned in the August 5th draft. What appears as smoke when the canister doors close is actually the remaining PKE of the entity. Just as class ones are often mists. Is it just a mist that doesn't have arms and legs? This is the leftover energy and has nothing to do with heat. The rechargeable battery means the ghost trap cannot hold ectoplasmic entities indefinitely. That is exactly why the containment unit was created. The removable canisters allows the penny trap to be maintained while the manifestation is transferred to the permanent storage facility. But what do you think? Are we onto something or is this just a trap? It's a trap! If you liked this video and think we deserve it, I've worked with better, but not many. Please subscribe. If you are in the position to help, please support us on Patreon and keep checking in for more spooktacular videos. I'm Heidi with Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching. Boo, you whore.